tilt it back just a little bit more, okay, for normal. And you're right, I should have a picture of normal. So anti-burden, as you can see, the entire uterus is now pushing forward. And what is this structure here? Very good, the bladder. Okay, so now that uterus is pushing now real close to the bladder. If this person becomes pregnant, now they're going to have a lot of issues there. Okay, with all that pressure on the bladder. Okay, now, uh, anti-flex. Okay, now anti-flex here, it is sort of in an inverted position, but here you have the main body of the uterus here now flexed. Okay, and it's flexed over pushing towards that bladder. Here's retroflex where it's actually flexed over towards the rectum and retroverted where the entire uterus is now just pushed down over closer towards the rectum, okay? And this also can pose issues with um, the colon, okay? <clears throat> and I think that was that. Now, cystal seal. This is another one that's actually quite common, cystal seal and retro seal. And this comes from weakening of the muscles in the vaginal floor or the pelvic floor, okay? So I don't know if you guys went over the muscles of the pelvic floor in anatomy or the perineum. Did you go over the muscles of the perineum? <laughs> <laughs> Susie's like... No, because I remember Dr. Youssef like running out of time and so oh, I remember yes. he went into your lab. And I remember like, that. Oh. And, okay, that's it. It's okay. Yeah, I remember that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so. Any event, um, just to give you an understanding about the anatomy of the muscles of the pelvic floor, the perineum, they are strong enough to hold the contents of what they need to hold to hold support, but they're not that thick. Okay. Um, and so they can stretch out, they can weaken, okay, over time. Um, oh my God, I, I just thought of a crazy story. When, when I was in, you know, when I was in school and grad school, we took gross anatomy one, two, and three. So we worked on cadavers for like a whole year. And so when it was time to do the, the muscles of the pelvic floor, I'll never forget, we had an instructor, he's going over all the muscles. And keep in mind, when you're working on a cadaver, you, the cadaver actually, the fluids inside the cadaver are settled from when they, that person died. So he's, we're, he's showing us the muscles and he actually presses right in the perineum. And you can imagine what came out. Okay, so all this poop came out. It was just like, oh my God. So um, <laughs> that just reminded me for some reason. Because those muscles, that area is actually um, not that thick. That's the point of me saying that. Okay, it's not that thick. So in any event, um, the protrusion happens now of the bladder, okay? So what this is, this is the bladder now protruding through the vagina, okay? So I know you're probably wondering how did that happened, okay? So again, these muscles of the pelvic floor get very weak and the bladder can actually just start to drop, okay? And again, this is all for weak muscles, okay? and pushing down into the vagina. So yes, this is where the Kegel exercises do come in, okay, to strengthening the floor, the muscles in the pelvic floor. Okay. Now, causes here, they say injury during childbirth. Yes, this is quite common with females that do have multiple births, childbirths, okay? So uh, females that have five and six kids, um, it's a strong possibility that they will have a cystal seal, okay? Um, aging, obesity, they say do, can do this, and also heavy lifting, okay? Uh, my mom always told me, stop lifting heavy things, it can weaken, and it's true, it can weaken uh, your muscles there. Now, symptoms, uh, vaginal <coughs> pressure, fullness, dysuria, although depending on how much of the protrusion, they may not feel anything, okay? Sometimes they'll go to the doctor and they'll say, oh, don't you know you have a cystic cyst right there? Oh, they didn't know, okay? But when it is protruded out a little more. They do have more urinary issues, okay, as you can imagine. 
um, and also back pain. So the treatment here is to surgically repair the vagina to restore the bladder and remove it to its normal position. Uh, so this is what it looks like. So let me just explain. What you're looking at is the vaginal orifice. So what's happening here is that you see this bulge at the, let's just say the superior portion, or I believe they call it anterior vagina, uh, the anterior vaginal orifice. This bulge is the vagina, uh, excuse me, the, uh, I'm sorry, the bladder, okay, protruding through the vagina. This is the bladder. Now the next thing we're going to look at is something called a retroceal, which is the rectum coming out of the vagina, okay? And that is towards the bottom. Okay, I'm sorry we're talking about these things, but yes, this can happen. Okay. And let me know if you have a patient that has <laughs> I usually see students in the hallway and they'll say, Oh, I had that. Y'all had a patient that had you know, sister seal. So you may see these things. Okay. So that's what the vaginal mesh is for. Okay, the vaginal mesh is for that, for the sister seal. Oh, and it's a recall? Okay, sorry. Retro seal. And cystal seals are quite common, just to let you know. Those are also very common, just like the prolapse. Okay, they're quite common. So, retro seal, and pro or also known as proctal seal, this is now the protrusion <coughs> of the rectum coming to the posterior part of the vagina. Okay, so the bottom portion. Um, again, childbirth, weakening of the muscles through aging, multi-parity, multiple pregnancies, okay? The more pregnancies, as you can imagine, it's stretching everything and pushing a lot of pressure, okay, on the pelvic floor, okay? Symptoms, depending on severity, now we're having more symptoms that are for rectal, okay, or colorectal symptoms. So these patients will have constipation. Please make sure you highlight that. Not so much of diarrhea, okay, but they will have constipation because now it's actually obstructing, okay, the flow of the bowel movement, okay, because the rectum is now in a different position. Uh, painful evacuation and definitely painful intercourse, okay. Treatment, they have to surgically repair this and put the rectum back in its proper position. And here it is. Yes. So it's not painful on the other one? During oh, no. The, uh, this one can also be painful during sex, <laughs> but this one is more painful during sex because the penis goes more towards the posterior part of the vagina, not the anterior part. Does the bladder or the rectum like completely fill the vaginal canal, I guess? It be, uh, it, if it gets really severe, like a real, like a more severe prolapse, it could. So, so. it's just like, like a partial. But it's just a partial. It's it's not a full obstruction of the vaginal orifice. It's just partial. But if it, you know, the more organ protrudes out, yes, it can. I know it sounds crazy, but yeah. it's just a partial. It's not the whole thing. Okay, so we're done with that. You guys need a break or you're okay? You're all right. Okay. PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, okay? Now, when you hear PID, they automatically associate this with STDs, okay? Now, let me say this about PID. PID is a term that is pelvic inflammatory disease. This means that there is an inflammation of any reproductive contents that are in the pelvic cavity, okay? Now, the cause of that inflammation could be, yes, they do associate this with STDs because there is a large percentage of people that have STDs that lead to a pelvic inflammatory disease. But there are other conditions where individuals can have a PID that is not STD related, okay? So let me just explain that. I'm not quite sure exactly how they will tell you when you get over to nursing exactly how to associate this. But the reason why I'm saying that is they're listing here all of the organs. Okay. Say, for example, 
a person has ovarian cysts. Cysts burst, and now the, they're filling up their contents. They have pelvic inflammatory issues, okay? They don't have an STD, but they have pelvic inflammatory issues because the rupture of that cyst has now caused an inflammation in the pelvic cavity, okay? So you understand where I'm going with that? So just understand that this is just an inflammatory process that occurs with these following reproductive organs, okay? And it can be any of that. <coughs> Common organisms, again, because they do associate this with um, uh, STDs, uh, the common organisms they say are gonorrhea and chlamydia, okay? Uh, so that's that. Causes, what happens here, the bacteria will actually um, obviously invade that particular area and then cause and form its colonies and cause obviously the infection in that region. Uh, pelvic surgery can also do this, so keep in mind that if individuals do have any type of surgical procedures in that area, this can now increase their risk for inflammatory issues. Whether it's from maybe an infection that can happen post-surgery, because that can happen, or if they have any type of scarring, okay? So keep in mind that they can have scarring that can occur post-surgery as well. Um, insertion of intrauterine devices, very good example, the IUD, okay? Nothing, nothing bad to say about the IUD, I don't, I'm not talking bad about it, but the IUD can cause pelvic inflammatory issues, okay? It can lead to that. Okay, abortion procedures, infections, and so forth. Now, signs and symptoms, um, abdominal tenderness, okay, cervical pain, fever, elevated white blood cells, so anything that goes along with that itis, okay. Treatment, <coughs> they usually give them early aggressive antibiotic treatment, okay. With that, and again, the early aggressive antibiotic treatment, this is usually for those that are STD related, so the gonorrhea, the chlamydia. Chlamydia, from my understanding, is more common than gonorrhea. I think there's more of a higher incidence of that. I think that's the most common STD that is contracted. And that one is, uh, can be treated with the antibiotic, okay? And if it gets really bad, yes, they have to have uh, surgery. So they're showing you here what can happen. And this is, well, they're showing strep staff in this situation. Okay, so in any event, um, they're showing here the strep, okay, and the staph, and how this actually can go into the different areas of the reproductive tract and just cause now an itis in that particular situation. Okay. And that can happen. Now this, again, strep and staph, since they're using that uh, microbial agent um, and not the gonorrhea and chlamydia. Gonorrhea, chlamydia, we know are STD related. Strep and staph, again, this comes from bacteria that comes from the ex external, okay? So again, this is more of a hygiene situation, okay? Or whatever's going on in that region. Okay. Now, vulva vaginitis, commonly known as candida albicans, the organism that causes this. Okay, this is the inflammation of the vulva and the vagina. Uh, please keep in mind that there are other causes of this, trichomonas vaginalis. Did you guys go over this in micro, some of this stuff? Yes? Somebody saying no, yes. Neisseria gonorrhea, HPV, herpes type 2. Did you go over that? Yes. Okay. So all of these things, all of these organisms can cause just what is called the inflammation in that region. Okay, that's all we're saying. Okay, so obviously when patients do have this issue, okay, and they'll come in with the signs and symptoms, the itching, the whatever is going on, okay, discharge or whatever. And then what will happen is, yes, it has to be cultured to see what's going on to see if that actual organism is there. So other things, chemical irritation for feminine hygiene products, yes, tampons, okay, can cause this issue. Um, trauma, any type of allergic reactions, um, such as clothing, okay, keep in mind that certain underwears and clothing and things do have dyes, okay, and so what happens sometimes people are allergic to that and that can also cause that situation. And antibiotics, antibiotic therapy, um, keep in mind 
does change the normal flora in a female's reproductive tract, especially the vagina, and it can also cause this now to have them to have more susceptible to infection. Okay. It changes the pH balance. Okay. So symptoms here, thick white discharge, okay, um, the intense itching, uh, purulent discharge, and, and all that. So treatment here is going to be antibiotic, antifungal, or antiviral, depending on what the actual cause is. Okay, so again, we know that there's several causes. Um, and that's that. And avoid whatever it's causing the irritation. Bartholinitis. This is inflammation of the Bartholin glands. Okay, so again, I don't know if you look at this in the reproductive system and anatomy, but the Bartholin glands actually lie on the inside surface of the vaginal orifice. So what happens here is that these glands can actually get swollen and tender, and what will happen is it can actually get swollen, and if it gets really bad, it can actually kind of close off the orifice of the vagina if it gets that bad, okay? So this here, um, signs and symptoms, abscess causing tenderness, swelling, pus, can actually build up, fever and malaise. Okay, they do say that this is also a situation that it ca is caused from the bacteria. They're not saying what bacteria, but a bacterial infection can cause this situation. So therefore, patients have to have antibiotic therapy. Now, because these are glands, they can surgically drain them. Okay, so please keep in mind that this, these glands are just filling up with pus, so they can go in and drain them. And again, because of its location, you want to remove that. Myomas, myomas, also known or commonly known as fibroids. Okay, um, I think they chart the myomas um, or sometimes fibroids. Okay, so uterine fibroids. Um, most common uterine tumor. This is very, very common. Just to let you know, um, they give you the incidence here. Um, make appearance and grow during reproductive years. Growth is enhanced by high estrogen and go growth hormone levels, okay? Please keep in mind that these are uterine tumors that grow pretty much inside <coughs> the endometrial wall. Um, I think I told you guys um, about my girlfriend that had the fibroids, I'm telling you about her. So she actually had 26 in her uterus. Um, they removed 20 of them. Six are actually still there because of the fact that it's, of its location is still pretty stuck to the wall so they couldn't get, you know, get them all out. Um, so they actually have to wait to hopefully they fall down a little bit more close to the endometrium so where they can pull it out. Um, and what happens here, when females do have fibroids, and this is not the first time I've heard of this situation, um, they will have a very large abdominal area. So what will happen is, you know, females are working out, going to the gym, and like, well, I'm not losing my stomach and not realizing that they are developing these little tumors in their uterus, okay? And so um, until what will happen is they'll notice that the menstrual cycle will be off a little bit, it's a little heavy flow, something's not right. Um, very painful menstruation that goes along with this as well. And they, these patients also do have a lot of pain as these fibroids grow, as you can imagine. Um, <clears throat> so this is what they look like. Okay, so here's a picture here. Of these fibroids, and I do have another picture. I think I'll pull up. Event. They're showing you here, I, I, I like this picture because they're showing you here the different sizes. Please understand that these fibroids can get very large, okay, to the point where they can grow the size of a fetus, 
even. Okay? They can get very large. Um, now, if it gets to that point, obviously, you know, they, they try to catch it before it gets to that point. But they can get very large. The size of a melon, a cantaloupe, you know, it can get extreme. So imagine if a person were to have, say, that size and like maybe 10 of those inside. Um, they, when these fibroids grow, they usually don't grow um, just one at a time. They usually grow multiple, okay, multiple fibroids at a time. So just understand that, yes. In your friend's case, since she still has six, they couldn't have no virus agents or hysterectomy. She doesn't want to have a hysterectomy. She doesn't want to have a hysterectomy. And the crazy thing was, she said the doctor told her if she gets pregnant, that that will help bring them to the surface or bring them out. Um, so, yeah. But she's not, um, she's my age, she's 37, 38, so she doesn't want to have a hysterectomy at this point. Yeah, that, that's what they would do, is to have a hysterectomy, but she doesn't want to have it. Okay. Okay, so these are the fibroids again, and so signs and symptoms again. Please understand that these individuals do have issues with menstruation. I don't want you to think they have a normal menstruation. Menstruation is going to be either abnormal bleeding, increased bleeding, or painful menstruation. <coughs> If the mass gets very large, they will have obviously a lot of abdominal pain and pressure, back ache, also obviously it goes along with this. Because of the position of the uterus, keep in mind that if it's large, it can start to compress on other organs. And not only compress on other organs, but keep in mind of the term what is called visceral somatic pain. Okay, does everybody know what that means? Anytime that there's pain in the viscera or any organ inside the body, it does have a referral to the somatic area, which would be the back. Please understand, and I see this obviously a lot in, in my profession, where patients have back pain, back pain can mimic anything, okay? Anything that is in this region, okay? Um, so it's important to rule out all that stuff first, okay, and address that, and um, then deal with the back pain later. Constipation, urinary frequency, and urgency, okay? So treatment, again, depends on the size. Sometimes if they're small, they just kind of wait and see if, you know, if it grows bigger or whatever. Um, or they will definitely remove the larger ones. And yes, as you said, hysterectomy will be indicated, okay, uh, for those really severe cases. Okay. Next one here is ovarian cysts. This is another familiar situation, uh, or quite common situation, I should say, with uh, females. Um, ovarian cysts are quite common. Um, they are common around the childbirth age of females. Okay, so just to let you know, it's very rare that you'll see an ovarian cyst in a, a girl that just started her cycle or anything like that. So it's definitely around childbearing age that they will start to develop these cysts. Um, I was told from my own personal doctor that these ovarian cysts actually will develop more in women that are childbearing age that don't have children, that have not had children yet, okay, and I'll explain how that happens. Um, because they um, have not become pregnant, it now puts them at more risk because of the ovulation cycle and the eggs are just staying there and now turning into these little cyst formations. So we'll go over the different types of, or the different ways ovarian cysts actually come out, okay, develop. So there are sacs on the ovaries that contain fluid or semi-solid material, meaning that they're either an egg, okay, that's just stuck and didn't ovulate or release the time it was supposed to, or it can be just fluid material, or it could be the corpus luteum that actually stays and gets hard, okay. And so we'll go over the different things. Now, one way that this develops is what they call a follicular ovarian cyst, okay? So the follicular ovarian cyst is where you have the mature ovarian follicle, okay? So we know that 
the egg actually goes through its maturation process from primary, secondary, until it gets to its really big, okay, of uh, egg, mature egg. Once the mature egg is ready to be released during ovulation, what happens here, it does not release in this situation. So when it doesn't release, it will actually stay there and form what is called this ovarian cyst, okay? So this is a failure of ovulation or failure of the ova to be released during ovulation. Okay, so this is the follicular ovarian cyst. <clears throat> the corpus luteum type of ovarian cyst is when <coughs> the corpus luteum fails to degenerate. Okay, and let me just walk you back through an, uh, anatomy if you don't remember. When a female goes through ovulation, remember the corpus luteum covers the egg. Okay, does everybody remember that little yellow body, the yellow thing that covers? Corpus luteum covers the egg. When the female goes through ovulation and the egg is released, okay, if she does not become pregnant that month, the corpus luteum is supposed to dry up and disintegrate. The issue here is that this female is not becoming pregnant, and so what will happen is the corpus luteum will stay there, it's not disintegrating, and now turns into a cyst formation, okay, and then on top of that it'll start producing progesterone, you know, which is supposed to be secreted during pregnancy, but she's not pregnant. Okay, so this is the corpus luteum type ovarian cyst. Yes? So would birth control decrease the risk of this? Yes, birth control will decrease the risk of the corpus luteum type and the follicular type. Because what the birth control does, it'll keep the hormones in balance. Okay, so it will decrease that situation. Now, in the last one here, this is called theca lutein, where the cysts will actually, I should say, the ovaries will now start to fill up with the fluid. So there's a fluid, I'm not quite sure exactly how this happens or how common this particular one is, but it can fill up with sort of a fluid-filled cyst that happens down the ovaries. Okay, so this is a fluid formation. Uh, from my understanding, the corpus luteum and the follicular one, the follicular one I believe is the most common type of ovarian cyst. Signs and symptoms, sometimes uh, females will have these ovarian cysts and not know it, okay, um, until they rupture, okay, and when they rupture, it's not a pretty situation, okay, they do give a lot of pain, please keep in mind where the ovaries are located, if these ovarian cysts rupture, whatever the contents is, whether it's fluid or corpus luteum or whatever it is, now the contents of that cyst is now floating through the peritoneum or the abdominal cavity. This can now put a patient at risk for maybe a peritonitis or a sepsis or something like that. Okay, so understand that. Um, when it ruptures, it can also cause uh, intraperitoneal hemorrhage and abdominal pain. Patients do have severe pain when these cysts rupture. Please make sure you know that. Um, they'll be curled over almost like as if they have an appendicitis or something. Okay. Uh, treatment here is immediate surgery, and especially if it ruptures, okay, uh, because now the ovary is vulnerable, so we want to make sure that there's no stop the you know, progression of rupture. I believe they will either repair the site or, depending on what's going on, maybe take the ovary out. I'm not sure. Uh, but in any event, they have to treat it surgically. Last one is endometriosis. Endometriosis, just to sum this up, this is an abnormal extra tissue that lies, that gets laid down in the endometrial lining of the uterus. Okay? So endometriosis, we know that the endometrium has a lining, okay, that's shed every month. Okay, so we know that. But this is now a thicker lining that gets laid down in the uterus, okay, in the endometrium. Now, what would you expect if a woman has a very thick endometrium? What would you expect via issue? You can't, that's infertility also, sometimes because the egg can't attach to it. Very good, okay. Infertility can definitely be an issue, okay, because now we have an altered endometrium, which means 
when the egg tries to attach or even, you know, the growth of the feet, it won't happen, okay, because of the thickness. <clears throat> okay, so once implanted, ectopic tissues um, periodically rupture and bleed in response to reproductive hormones. So please understand that once they now have a, a laying down of this tissue, this can now start to give them painful menstruation, extra bleeding, okay, that can occur. Um, they can also have spilling of discharge into the peritoneum, okay, so this is how bad that this can get. Um, irritations with adhesions and so forth. Okay. Um, they do have a couple of theories of how patients get endometriosis. So how do these women get this extra lining? Okay, what did it just happen? They believe one of two things, or actually a combination of the two. One thing is transplantation. They believe that somehow when the female goes through the menstrual cycle and it sludges off the lining, normally of the endometrium, that it doesn't completely sludge off or there's a backup or reflux of the blood. Okay, so they believe that that can cause an issue and cause now this extra tissue to just stay there. Yes? <laughs> Which one? Transportation or transportation? Uh, transportation. So when they talk about transportation, they're talking about transportation of the blood. Transportation of the blood or the endometrial lining moving forward during normal menstruation. So the endometrial tissue flows backward, okay, through the, so that's what they're trying to say. It flows backward instead of going forward to where it's supposed to go. The other thing here is, here we go, metaplasia. Okay, so we've seen this term before. So they believe here the metaplasia uh, happens in the endometrial wall, okay, and now this causes obviously the thickening, okay. So inflammation or hormonal changes will now cause the cell type to change to another cell type in the endometrial lining. And then induction. Induction, they just mean here that they believe that it's a combination of transplantation, or excuse me, transportation and metaplasia. So they believe it's just a combination. Size of this pelvis is they say the, uh, I think the most common in order of frequency, um, ovary, peritoneum. So it can actually happen in a lot of different areas. Usually when people think of endometriosis, they automatically think of the uterus, which, yes, that is the most common site, but it can happen in other areas. So understand that they can just have this thickening, okay, that can happen in other areas of the reproductive system. So I'm trying to find you a decent picture. area there, okay, here on the ovary, here on the fallopian tube, then we even got a little portion here on the bladder, okay, and extended all the way over there. So this is just extra tissue, okay, that is now just laid over that particular organ. So please keep in mind that endometriosis is not just localized to the uterus, although yes, that is a common spot, but it can pretty much go anywhere in that area. And again, this is either one, either from a backup of blood or just a metaplasia, okay, that causes it. 